I thank my God every time I remember you. To live is Christ, and to die is gain. He made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Hey, um, we are in week three of a study that we started in Philippians uh, and uh, we kind of uniquely started this study. We didn't start in Philippians. We started in the book of Acts so that um, uh, we could get a good backstory on, on this book and the people going on and who they're writing to and all that kind of stuff. Because if you haven't realized, our modern day living is a little bit removed from some of the cultures and the things of the biblical time. So if you want to get a good understanding, it's good to get a, a, a concept of the context of what's going on and the people and what's happening at the time so that you can understand and fully get because you want to know why are they writing to who they're writing to. So I challenge you, if you haven't already gotten the app, download that. It's only fifty nine ninety nine and it goes straight into my account, so that's it's cheap. I'm kidding, it's free. It doesn't cost anything. People are looking at me like, you can't even joke like that. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, uh, but download the app, and then on the app, there's the past sermons. You can kind of catch up, or you can uh, go, go on there, and, and you can, you know, online giving, or you can do the events and, and track, you know, the event calendar and add it to yours and kind of do all kind of stuff on there. So, so check, check that out. Um, but you can, you can watch the past ones. To, today is, uh, is part three. We're going to be looking mainly at chapter two of Philippians. So if you have uh, one, of those, one of those physical things that actually have pages you know, made from trees, you can go ahead and get that out and turn to Philippians chapter two. If not, the, the, you, you have uh, your phone, you can use that or the family Bible up on the screen. We're going to have the um, scripture on here in just a minute. But we called it uncommon because I really do believe in this, um, in this book, the way that it's written and who it's written to, it's a little different than the other letters that this guy, uh, Paul, wrote to other people. It's a little bit different, and I believe that if we will apply these concepts that we can really live uh, an uncommon life, because if you look through the scripture, um, Jesus has never called us and God's never called us as believers and disciples to just live in a common everyday, go by the flow of everything else kind of life. He's called us out of common to live for him um, in, a, in an uncommon way. So I really believe this is going to help us if we apply these things to our life. Uh, and um, what we, we kind of discovered last week is one of the main kind of veins and themes through the book of Philippians is this idea of joy. How to have joy, and really how to have joy no matter what. Because whenever you understand this guy, Paul, and you understand the situations he went through, you really get that um, this is a guy talking about having joy that didn't have an easy life. I mean, think about it. This guy's sitting in prison when he's writing the book of Philippians. Whenever he was in Philippi, where he met these people, he also went to prison. And then so he gets out of prison, goes and, and continues on his journey, and then not too long after, about 10 years later, he's in prison again, but he's writing this book all about helping people to live in joy. I mean, how does this guy do this? Because he can do it because he, he, he lives it. So it's all about how to have joy no matter what. I can live that life. I want to understand that because not every day is going to be happy. I like being happy, I like smiling, I like sitcoms and, and, and laughing, but if really life is about happy, uh, half the time life would really seem pointless, if that's what it's about. But, but Paul writes and talks about, look, there's a way that you can have something that transcends a momentary happy and live in joy. And so we talked about last week really unpacking the difference between happy and joy and their stark differences. So um, we're going to kind of continue in that same thought. And the letter continues uh, at the very end of chapter 1 in verse 27. And uh, he's talking back to them and he says this. He's like, whatever happens, you don't usually say that unless you anticipate something bad happening, right? Like, some, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving and I'm going. I don't usually start the conversation when I'm going to the office. Hey, whatever happens, just remember I mean, that's usually a pretty negative, like, hey, some things are probably going to happen, so whatever happens, remember these things. And it says, whatever happens to you, because things are going to happen, you're going to have bad days, you're going to have situations come up that aren't, 
aren't the greatest. You're going to have things come up where, where it's kind of unexplainable. How could this happen to me? Whatever happens, it says this, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the, the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come to see you, this is Paul talking to them, he said, whether I get to come back to you, or if I only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, um, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them uh, that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. What an encouraging guy this is. I mean, he is. He's trying to encourage them even through struggle. He's like, what a blessing it is for you to struggle. Um, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had and now hear that I still have. All I know is like, hey, whatever happens, I know you're going to be going through the same thing that I am. And this is a guy sitting in prison that's any day waiting possibly for his execution. You may not feel too encouraged thinking like, wait, hold up. This is what we're called to, to live out. But he says, even in the midst of the bad times, even in the midst of the most difficult times and the what's going on, he says, whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel. And he, he can, he, when, you, when you look in the book of Colossians and Ephesians, this is kind of a theme that Paul talks about a lot of times. He says it in, in these books. He says, hey, walk worthy of the gospel to which you were called to, to the calling to which you were called. Walk worthy, walk worthy. It's, it's live, live worthy, live as a reflection of the worth of what you're carrying. It's like, you know, you, you, you see the people, or you, probably the movies, I've never actually seen anybody do it, but you know, somebody with like a, like a briefcase handcuffed to their hand, you know, like I've never, you know, seen that, but I'm sure that it actually maybe really happens. So they, what they're doing is they're walking worthy of what's, the value that is in the case, right? So you got a bunch of money. You're, man, you're handcuffing that baby on. You got security around because you're walking, because what's in here is valuable. You're walking in such a way that reflects that you're carrying something that's valuable. And what he's saying to these people is, hey, look, realize that, that Christ is more valuable than anything. And so no matter what happens, walk in such a way that is worthy of the value that you're carrying in Jesus because things are going to happen, but the worth of Jesus doesn't change. And I think we can put it a different, a different way, and this is going to set up the rest of what we're going to talk about today. Don't let difficulty determine your direction. Don't let difficulty determine your direction because think about it. How many times do we, um, you know, we drive or something and then uh, there's a little bit of traffic and then we have on our phones this little thing that says rerouting, rerouting. It can take you around traffic and get you back going back on a different direction. See, the thing is we, we, we don't um, do that and we're like, you know what, I'm headed to, uh, to work. We run into a little bit of traffic and like, I'm just going to go home. You just turn around and go home. No, the idea is to go around the traffic but still end up in the same direction. But what happens in life what seems to continually happen is like when we run into something, we change the course of direction. Instead of us continuing to follow after what we say we'll believe in, we change where we're going. And we, and we just give up. We give in and we quit. But we can't let the difficult times change the direction of where we're heading. Too often we give up the best for our lives and we settle for what's easy. Okay, too, too often we give up the best because the best is, is sometimes ahead of the road, beyond the road construction. Because we want to just live what's easy, but we wind up where God never wanted us to be. Don't change our direction because things are going to get difficult. He said, whatever happens. See, because here's a fact, because whatever happens is going to happen. Like it's, I mean, it's, it's going to happen. Your life is going to hit, hit bumps and, and there's going to be things come up that you never expected Paul never thought that he'd be sitting in prison. We talked about this last week. His dream was to, was to preach from a platform in Rome to see thousands come to Christ, but now he's chained to a prison guard in prison in Rome. But it still talks about joy and being able to live this thing out. The fact is it's coming. The myth is the difficulty has to determine where you end up. That's what Paul wants us to understand. So Paul continues on into chapter 2. What you have to realize, too, about the Scripture is this. The Scripture, especially in the New Testament, a lot of those were written in letters. 
um, they weren't written, like he, he, he didn't sit there and write this, verse 1, and this, this, verse 2. He's sitting there writing a letter, and it's later on, um, when it was put into what we call our, our Bible, they put chapters and verses. So sometimes we just read chapter 1 and like we're done, but sometimes the thought will continue out into, into other, other chapters uh, so you read in context. So this is a flowing letter that goes together. So we continue to read, and it says, therefore, you, know, I mean, you may have heard this before, and I've said it before. If you see the word therefore, you've got to ask, what's it? Therefore, there we go. Yeah, it's pretty easy. If you see the word therefore, say, hey, what, what's it there for? And so it's talking about, and it's connecting chapter, chapter 1 with chapter 2. She said, therefore, since that, I've called you to walk worthy. I've told you you're going to encounter some difficult times. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion. So we we read this, and and sometimes it's easy to breeze through the scripture and not understand that like an actual human wrote it. Um, Inspired by the Holy Spirit, like people actually pin this down, and what you got to realize about this part right here, if anybody heard like rhetorical statements, it's like, I know the answer to this, or like a rhetorical question, like, man, I'm awesome, right? That's rhetorical. Like, you don't have to answer. I realize that it's true. Nobody's agreeing. That's cool. I didn't need you. I didn't need you to agree. But so what he's doing here is he has some rhetorical statements. So he's not like, hey, if you've ever been encouraged from kind of, you know, being united with Christ, or if you found any comfort in his love, like there's no if, there's no if, like if there's comfort from his love, what he's doing is he's making a plea. It's kind of like um, whenever you really want something, and, and you're like, honey, if you ever loved me, you'd, you'd, you'd make me a bowl of ice cream, you know, and like, I was just talking to somebody earlier about sickness, like, I don't know, I really don't know if I just get really sick when I get sick or if I just can't handle sick. Like, and I'm going to be honest. I saw something the other day online that said um, when, when, a, um, uh, when a woman has a child, she almost knows what it's like for a man to have a cold. Yeah, it's like, it's like I'm like, exactly. You don't know what we go through. Our bodies are made different. But so, like, in those times, I get a little whiny, and so, so I make some pleads, honey, if you ever loved me, or honey, you know, you know, those, those kind of pleads, if you ever cared about me, if you ever loved me, then, then this, and that's more of what Paul's saying, he's like, if you've ever felt like we've been united together under Christ, if you've ever been comforted by his love, if you've ever shared in this common thing in the spirit together if if you've ever experienced the tenderness and compassion it's not like he's questioning if they've ever done that it's rhetorical statements then he continues on with verse two he says then make me a bowl of ice cream you know then he says make my joy complete it's 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 a rhetorical statement because he's trying to get them if this has ever happened if look if you've ever loved me if you've ever cared about me paul writing this letter if you've ever cared about us being together under Christ, then make my joy complete. So he's pleading with them to do something. Um, and like we already said, Paul, this guy, if, he, if there's any expert on being able to talk about joy, it's the guy who's able to be glad about stuff and thankful for stuff whenever he's being beaten and tortured in prison. Okay, If this guy can have a good attitude, I feel like I can probably learn something from him. Because I have a bad attitude when they give me sausage instead of bacon on my biscuit. Anybody with me? Like, I'm not going to lie. One day I threw the biscuit. And not at them. I didn't throw it, like, back in the window. I had the temper tantrum all by myself. You know, nobody saw it, I don't think. But it's like, then I picked it up. I was like, that was stupid. And then I ate it off the floor. It just is what it is. I was really hungry. But it's like, how ridiculous to get such temperamental about small things whenever Paul really experienced big things, but in the midst of it, was able to have joy. He's an expert, but he even says, he's looking at them and say, hey, there's still something incomplete about the joy that I have. Make my joy complete. He's telling them, he's pleading with them to complete the joy that he has. There's still something lacking. It's like, at my house, I have children, and if you, if you have children, ever been around children, if you've ever seen a child, you know what I mean by this. Um, nothing is ever complete. Like, we have board games, 
Every one of them is missing a dice or a little character, every one of them. Um, we, we have puzzles. Nothing irks me more than to get to the end of the puzzle and you're missing like one or two pieces. Like, I, I just, I don't know how, why that makes me so unspiritual. But there are, obviously a lot of things make me unspiritual. This is confession time. It's like sausage and bacon. I, I don't know. This is a bad, this, I'm, I'm messed up, guys. But it's like, I'm getting all the way down to it. And I'm like, you know, I'm really working hard. And then it's like, there's one right in the middle. It's like, boom. It's like, so you get a Sharpie and try to finish the picture out, but it's not the same. And so that's kind of where, where Paul's like, hey, he's like, hey, I'm living out this joy, but there's still an incomplete part. There's still a, a piece to the puzzle that's missing. And I'm pleading with you, help me complete this puzzle piece of joy in my life. Help me complete this. Help me to have fulfillment in my joy. Um, see, he wasn't just making a plea. What he was doing, if we'll look at this, he's teaching a principle. He wasn't just pleading. He was, he was through this. He's teaching us something that we can understand. And here's what I want us to know on the underlining thing. If you don't leave with anything else, um, remember this today before you leave. Fulfilled joy within me comes from living beyond me. Thursday, I was out with my kids at the park, which I should have prayed first, and I know. I should have really had some Jesus time before I did that, and I did. And that's on me, not them. So we go, um, I was going to go to Taco Casa because I tried to convince them that what I want is what they want. You know what I mean? It's like, no, you don't want McDonald's. Ugh, like tacos, taco time. <laughs> Two of the kids was convinced. My, my son was not at all. So we had to go to Taco Casa and McDonald's, which is okay. It was across the street. So then we went to the park and we played around the park a, l- a little bit. And, and so um, they, were, they were all having fun. And Alyssa, my 11-year-old, um, she she's, wants to go on the monkey bars, and so uh, she goes, she starts off well, she takes off and goes one, two monkey bars, and then stops, waits about 30 seconds and falls. I'm like, baby, you gotta, you gotta keep going, you gotta, gotta keep the momentum going, don't stop in the middle, coming from a guy that like, yeah, like I can do monkey bars, okay? I, then I tell her, look, I can do it, and I'm walking, and, and she's like, it's cheating, you're just short. Um, I don't need muscles when you're tall enough to do it. Um, but I tell her, hey, look, you know, don't stop in the middle because your hands will get weak. So you just need to keep going. Go to the next monkey bar. Go to the next. And then she does it again. One, two, stops. Falls. I'm like, baby, I'm telling you, if you'll just listen to daddy, he's not as dumb as he looks. Just, just keep going. Keep going. Just keep trying. Go to the next monkey bar. Go to the next monkey bar. And then over and over and over and over again, she does this. And then she falls the last time. I was like, what's the matter? And she says this. She said, look, she said, instinct tells me to hang on for dear life. <laughs> My baby, you're 11. You're a foot off the ground. <laughs> I can understand your five-year-old sister having a problem with this, but... So she said, instinct tells me to hang on for dear life. I'm like, that's a lot of wisdom from an 11-year-old girl. I, said, that, and I just kind of muttered, that'll preach right there. And she didn't know what it meant. Um, but then the same day, l- later on, my, my, my family, they go to the pool. And so they're, they're going to swim. And, and I had to run back to the house and turn the oven off. Different story. Um, but so I ran back home to turn the oven off. And then, so when I came back to the pool, I had heard that my son almost drowned in the pool. Uh, and then, so here's what happened. As soon as they get to the pool, he gets so excited. He's my eight-year-old uh, Zane. He lives in Zane World. If you know Zane, you'll understand. It's okay. It must be a great place because he's there a lot. Like, hey, Zane, we're in the real world. Come on. I love him, though. Um, I really do. Uh, but he, that boy sometimes, he... he he was in Zane World right here because he got so excited. This is like, and I, you see the excitement all over his face. I can just see it right now because he does. He gets excited about the things he gets excited about. So he takes off for the slide, goes up the slide, goes down. And about halfway down, I'm just paraphrasing because I wasn't there, but I'm just imagining from his retelling of the story, he realizes how fast he's going. He didn't think about it on the way up the stairs. On the way down, he's like, this is going really fast. And he begins to panic. And then he begins to think, it's going to dump me out in water that I can't swim that's over me. Uh, so he begins to panic. And so he hits the water and just goes to do like this and fling his arms. And so the lifeguard has to jump in and save him. And then so like my wife, who is the most amazing and beautiful and awesome person in the world, can't swim. So... 
I'm sorry. You know, I had to just tell all. And so she's over there, and she's like, ah, oh, you know, she's looking. So the lifeguard saves him. But what's so funny is that after I get there, my son, whenever I'm like, okay, dude, what, what's the matter? What's the problem? He, he, he goes with me, and we're like swimming the length of the pool. He knows how to swim. Like, he has no problem swimming. Like, we swam back and forth, and, and he, has, he, has a, he, he does it great. Um, but whenever something came up that scared him that he didn't understand, he began to panic. Um, see, here, here's what instinct says. Instinct says when things get difficult or a little out of my control, forget everything that you know to be true and just take care of me. Go into defense mode and just try to make sure that I'm okay. Difficulties instinct says this, turn inward and self-preserve and make sure that I'm good. And for some reason, Zane thought it meant this. Alyssa thought it meant this. But regardless, instinct says take care of me and make sure at the end of this, I'm going to be okay. And it makes us forget everything that we know to be true because we want to look at us and take care of us. Difficulty's instinct wants to find happy again. It's like a turtle, right? So, so in life, difficulties come up. You know, the predator comes up, something. You go into your shell and, like, find your happy place, find your happy place, find your happy place, find your happy place. And we try to always in life get back to a happy place, have a difficult day. A lot of us turn to things that we shouldn't do. We, we forget about what we, what we know to be true and right and what's God honor, we turn to what's, what we know we, things we know we shouldn't do at the end of a difficult day sometimes, all because it makes us feel happy and needed and loved at the moment. See, and this is another difference though, between, between happiness and joy. It's a difference uh, to build on what we talked about last week. See, the experience of happiness is about me. It's about self-preservation. It's about, I want to do whatever it takes to make me happy and secure and feel good at this moment. Zane knew how to swim, but halfway down that slide, he forgot everything he'd ever learned ever. I don't think he knew his name. Like, I mean, because that's what difficulty does. It just makes you forget things you know, and you go into default mode of, I'm going to self-preserve even if it doesn't make sense. And every one of us live that every day. And we can call it Eric world or Christy world or whatever. We go into our own world and you forget that there's more. You forget there's a better way, but we try to self-preserve. Experience of happy is all about me. And you're like, no, I, I, I get happy whenever other people do things. I, I'm happy around my kids. No, you're happy around your kids when your kids are doing what you want them to do. Let's be honest. That's what makes you happy. I love my kids too, but I'm not happy whenever, uh, every time I'm around my kids. I'm just not. See, but joy, joy builds and lifts others. Happiness is about me, what makes me happy. If people are doing things that make me feel good to lift me up, fulfilled joy is a life that's building and lifting up others. See, fulfilled joy, you can have children. And you can be around them, and there's a moment where you're not too happy, but you can still have joy because sometimes in the middle of homework, daddy ain't happy. Like, right, we've done this 15 times, but there is a joy to come along when you see the kids, it just comes on, and there's a joy whenever they're learning, and there's a joy when they're growing. There's a stark difference between happiness and living a life of joy because happiness is, are they doing what I want them to do so that I can feel good about me and they're making me laugh and me happy? Joy says, even if it's a little bit of an inconvenience, my life is being lived to lift up their life. And that brings a life of fulfilled joy. Happiness is about me. Paul's teaching the Philippians here, and he's going to go on just a second to begin to continue his teaching that there is something more. There's a life bigger than the little world that you live in. And if sometimes we'll lift our eyes up, like I tell my kids when they're, when they're walking and they're like, wanna, last Sunday, my, my youngest, since I've talked about the rest of them, I've got to talk about the youngest, she had a phone in front of her walk, trying to walk downstairs, play a game. It's like, she is going to die. You know, there have been people walking in front of traffic playing Pokemon Go, okay? This happens, people. It's like we're just looking at our phones, walking in traffic, walking downstairs, not realizing if we would just look up, there's more and there's better. 
So Paul is wanting them to, hey, look up. You're, you're, we're, we're so focused on us and me. He's saying, look up because there's, there's more. He begins to teach them how to do this, how to complete that puzzle piece and live a life of joy. In the midst of your marriage, let's be honest, there's some days it's not going to be easy. There's some days we're not going to be happy about things, but we can still have joy. In the midst of your job, you may be somewhere where there's just not happy days all the time, but you can still live in, in this thing called joy. With children, sometimes I, 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 I'm not happy when things happen, but I live my life with joy knowing that I'm investing my life into something bigger. I don't live my life from one happy to the next. It's living your life on fragile emotions. But we can live more, and there's better in the midst of it, I, I just commit, I want my life to build up their life. And so how do we shift uh, outward beyond us to complete the joy that we, that we have? Um, uh, Paul talks about right here three things, three simple things that we'll continue on and hopefully you can learn from today. They're either joy builders or joy killers, whether you have them or not. The first one, let's, let's, let's read Philippians 2, 2 through 4. So let's back up. We'll read that, that, that second verse again. It says, then make my joy complete by, this is how you do it, by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and of one mind. Talking about unity, looking beyond us and other people, building up others. It says, it says this right here, do nothing, which means do nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interests of others. Do nothing. I'm not a smart guy, but I can interpret that for you. It means, out of everything, do none of it out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. And that's a big pill to swallow that says, hey, look at your whole life. And none of it is to be lived just because of selfishness. Because what's going to end is you're going you're gonna, to may have a life with some happy moments, but you have a life with no joy and you feel like it's going nowhere. And you're trying to live from one happy high to the next. And it doesn't work. Live beyond yourself. It's not about selfish ambition. It's a, don't do some things. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain, uh, uh, vain, vain conceit. So selfish is thinking about what? Who? Think about me. Me, myself, and I. And the word ambition that's used here is, is used, it's the word in Latin that kind of means like soliciting for votes. So you think about like whenever the certain time of the year comes around and like people are trying to get voted in office. Like, that's, this is what that word means. Don't live your life trying to elevate yourself and say, look at me, and trying to promote your own platform. That's what, what it means. Selfishly looking at me, lifting me up. Don't live for that. Don't live for selfish ambition, lifting me above other people. That's not how we're to live. Or vain conceit. Vain conceit could also mean inflated ego, thinking you're better than what you are. Guess what? You're not. Yeah, you're okay, but so is the person beside you. And then we always have this ego complex. We're either never good enough or always better than. He said, don't live with vain conceit, with inflated ego. Another way this is translated is empty glory. Doing things just to get glory, which means absolutely nothing. A lot of us live our lives this way. Man, I'm going to feel so good if I achieve this, and then it has no value, no nothing, means nothing. And, and another word is fictitious vanity. It's like... Mirror, mirror on the wall. Show me who the most awesome person in the world is. And you want to see that, that you, you back. It's, it's that fictitious, it's fake. It's vanity that's not even real. But we live for that. We live for that. So Paul is saying this is a way to keep joy from being complete. This is a joy killer. But I wonder, I wonder, just me, I'm wondering. And now, I know that y'all don't deal with this. Y'all don't struggle. Y'all are perfect. And that's why I love hanging out with y'all. I'm a little bit better every time that we show up together. Because y'all y'all know my, my difficulty. It's like small groups every time, but I've got the own mic. It's just counseling. I'm able to just say whatever I need to say, and hopefully, you know, y'all come back. Some weeks people don't. That's okay. I'm starting to understand why, I guess. I'm wondering, though, if I had a percentage, 
out of 100, how much percent of my life honestly is lived for me? Um, I probably wouldn't like the, the, the number that came back, if I'm being real honest. I know so many times I look at the little stupid things that I get mad about with my, with my children and at home, and I can always go back almost nine times out of ten and say, I got mad only because it wasn't about me. I got upset. It wasn't what I wanted to do. It's something that I would have got onto my kids for, acting the way that I acted, lifting me up, trying to be a bigger deal than what I really am, realizing that the only big deal is Jesus. And I want to walk worthy of that calling. I want to get mine out of life. I want to get what's coming to me. I want to get. But instead, it says, live to lift others up. Live to lift others. So how, how do we do that? Philippians 2, 5 says this. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, right? It's a little bit dated, but we can, that, that, the little bracelet that we used to all wear and the t-shirts that we had and the bumper stickers, what was it? WWJD. It's like, who remembers that? Let's be honest. Okay, what did it stand for? Well, you know what? That's kind of dated at this point. But I think it's one of the best ways to sum up what is it like to have the mind of Christ. In every situation, we're doing nothing out of selfish ambition, but we're asking ourselves, would Jesus do this? Would Jesus respond this way? Most of the time, the way that I act is probably like, mm. I kind of feel dirty after I just did that, because I know it's nothing like what Jesus would do. I'm ashamed. Because it was so much about me. Philippians 2, 6 through 11, it kind of begins just in, in, in a little bit to explain the mind, the mind of Christ. and says this, Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Think about this. Look, if anybody's like, hey, I can walk around with a God complex, it's God. Okay, do you get that? It's like Jesus, the son of God, he can probably walk around and be like, worship me. And he's got the right to do it. He's the only one. But he actually lived for the service of other people. He said, I did not come to be served but to serve. Like that was Jesus talking. The only person who, is actually, who has the right to, to have the God complex and want to be served. He said, rather he made himself nothing by taking advantage of the, the, taking the very nature of a servant, being made into human likeness and being found in the appearance of a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. See, what we don't realize about the cross is the most humiliating and worst way to die. It wasn't the way for somebody who was king to die. It was the way for scum to die. The worst of the worst, this is what they did. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is far above every name, the name at, that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And Jesus exampled what, he's talk, what we're talking about, the mind of Christ is to say, hey, you know what, I'm not going to live my life to just lift up me, I'm going to live my life to lift up others and only then can we kind of begin to understand what it is to experience real joy most of us will never know what it is because we can't get our eyes off of us long enough to realize that there's more out there why am i doing this why am i acting this way whose name am i building whose example am i following i think if we begin to ask ourselves some of those clarifying questions in the moment of our madness we realize it's like, ooh, that was kind of just all about me. And I'm ashamed at my answer majority of the time. So translate this to your everyday, whatever that looks like for you. I don't know what's going on in your life. I know my own messed up world. Your world's messed up too. Just apply it to you and say, hey, how much of this can I live or how much am I living just for me? And what do I need to change? So do nothing out of selfish ambition. How much friction within our relationships do we cause because we're trying to make ourselves a big deal and not other people? How much friction do we cause because we respond out of being inconvenienced and in position by someone else? Don't you think Jesus, I mean, 
God himself was a little inconvenienced. The man couldn't go anywhere, and they're like tugging on him and pulling on him. He's like, I just want to go to sleep. He couldn't, but he never, he never turned around and was like, get away from me. You're so annoying. I, those are the things that I say. Jesus didn't do that. He took time out. To, to care about and love others. So Paul continues in Philippians 2, 12 through 13, it says this. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now even so more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, um, in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Work out, here's, work out, who's ever heard this scripture before? It says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. I'm gonna be honest, I've read this many times and sometimes I was like, I don't know what that means. Cool, I'm gonna put that on a bumper sticker. And I, you know, but what, what does it mean to work out your salvation? The, the reference being used here in this scripture is, you, is using like a miner, like mining coal or diamonds. He says to work out is to get everything out of that mine that you possibly can. I want to leave nothing left. I want to get everything out of this life that I'm living for Jesus. I want to get everything out that I possibly can. I'm searching for value in it every single day. I'm walking with purpose in every step, realizing there's, there's worth in what I'm carrying, and I'm, I'm going in life like I am a miner going into a a, a, a a, a coal mine and say, I'm going to get every bit out of this that I can, leaving nothing behind. I'm going to pull everything of value out of this life that I can. I'm going to pull everything out that I can, do everything. Um, and, and so that's what it's talking about, is to, to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It's a realization that's like, I'm not as big of a deal as I think I am. God is. I'm, I'm, I'm living this life humbly, realizing that like, God is the one who, who controls everything. God is the one who, who is master. God is the one who is in charge. I am not. And so while we're doing this, while we're living this life for Jesus, while we're living this life for God, he continues on and he begins to talk to me individually. Maybe you can understand this, but me, I feel like he wrote this like with Eric wrote beside the note. He says, do this. In verse 14, do everything without grumbling or arguing. Like that was, I feel like parentheses was Eric. So that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. Again, that's that do everything or do nothing with. It, it's, it's that reference of everything. Do every, everything that you do, do it without grumbling or arguing. So the very first thing that we got to understand is the joy killer or the joy builder is that you're not as big a deal as you thought you were. I didn't even say the whole point. It was get over yourself. You're not as big of a deal as you think you are. The second one is this. Don't waste your breath. I don't know that I'm a good expert to speak on this. It wasn't that long ago we were driving in the car and, and going somewhere, and I can't remember what was going on, but... Um, if, if you have a mom, if you have a wife, if you have a, a lady in your life that you're close enough to, you understand what I mean by the look. Anybody got it? I don't think I have to define the look because every look is a little different. Some will make you want to use the bathroom on yourself. Some will make you stop in your tracks and cry. Some just make you realize I've done something wrong. And so we were driving in the car one day, and I got the, I've done something wrong look. And, like, and I know it. I'm picking up on it. She's trying to be subtle. But so I'm driving in the car. I'm like, what's the matter? And so she's like, nothing. Oh, worst word ever. Cody Hogg is sitting over here. Cody, raise your hand. He's the bass player. He's about to get married. If she ever says nothing, she's lying, Okay. Because women, what I've realized, there's always something going on. If they say nothing, that means it's about you and it's not good. So I'm like, well, what's, what's, the, what's the matter? What is going on? Nothing. And so I'm, I I'm finally keep pestering her. I'm like, what's going on? And like, why, why are you acting mad? She said, well, you've been griping about everything all day. And we're getting tired of it. And I'm like, so then I'm like, inflated ego, going back to the first one, get over yourself. I'm like, What? Have you been living with me today? I'm a pleasant person. 
If you don't like it, you can get out of the car. I mean, she's, I mean, she just told me how it is. Like, I got to be honest. I probed, and she said, and I knew someone, you've been griping about everything all day long. I used to think griping was my love language. Like, that's how you know I love you. If I'm like, it was a little burned. Like, that means I love you. It's like I'm just calling out things that apparently people don't respond that way. Griping is just another way, and complaining and creating arguments is another way of pointing out people's faults that they have. It's another way of looking at other people and realizing what you don't like about it and voicing it. And a lot of us, me included, the king of, the, king, king of all, we waste most of our breath in life griping about people and things we don't like. It's easy and selfish, and it's instinct to point out fault and to complain about things that didn't go our way, and to start arguments. She's over there going like, I know she ain't doing I'm putting words in her mouth. She's being really sweet and looking at me and smiling, but she's thinking like, I hope you're listening to yourself. I'm trying, hon. But this is the quickest way to rob your joy, and honestly to rob joy of the people around you. It's um, been going on long enough, it's not a new current trend to gripe, complain, and to argue. Paul puts it in his letter. He said, do everything without grumbling or arguing. Basically, it's like, you're killing all of our joy, man. Just, just stop. Quit complaining so much. It's unproductive, and here's what it is. Honestly, at the end of the day, all of our griping and our complaining, it's a waste of our breath. It's a waste of good breath. We're just wasting air. Instead, we can build our joy. Look at, look at how this finishes. Philippians 2, 16 through 18 says this. Then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and, and service coming from your faith. Now, realize their culture being poured out like a sacrifice is not a good thing about to happen. It's like, even if I'm, my, I'm sacrificed, my, my whole self, I'm killed because of what I believe, even if I'm poured out like a sacrifice, uh, he says, I am glad and rejoiced with all of you, and you too should be glad and rejoice with me. See, Paul examples what to do instead. He's like, quit gropping and complaining. Like, you're getting on everybody's nerves. Nobody likes being around you. Look, you're always pointing out the faults of everybody else, and it's the biggest joy killer there is. So Paul examples what to do instead. He, he's in prison, for goodness sake, standing up for what he believed. If anybody could have a little gripe session, get on a soapbox, shouldn't it be him? But instead, he looks for reason to boast and to brag and to rejoice. To, and then I'll be able to boast on the day of Christ. He's like, hey, look, I'm glad and rejoice with you. You should be glad and rejoice with me too. What? Here, here's the deal. In life, you're going to find what you look for. Um, I'm going to walk out of here today and I'm going to be able to find 27 things to gripe about. Before I get to my car, I am good. But I realize I can find that many things to boast about and to brag about and to compliment on and to rejoice in. But what I find is what I look for. And Paul chose not to waste his breath. Even in the midst of the worst, when he had the right, you would think of anybody to gripe and complain, he chose to look for what he can rejoice about and brag about. And he said, you know what? Quit wasting your breath griping and complaining. Join in with me. Let's rejoice together. So the question is, are you complaining or re rejoicing? The last one is this as we close. Philippians 2, 19 through 24 says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon. He was a helper in the faith and he helped Paul with everything. He said, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interests, their instincts to self-preserve, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a 
because as a son with his father, he has served me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I'm confident in the Lord that, my, that, that I myself will come soon. See, he uses Paul, as, I mean, Timothy as an example. As an example of somebody who actively lives out living beyond himself for the good of others. Talk is cheap. Talk is cheap. Um, we can talk about caring for other people. We can talk about living beyond ourselves. and We can talk about that all day long. But what are we actually doing? What is our life lived doing? Are you, or do you do anything beyond yourself? Or how much is done in just selfish pursuit? Griping, complaining, wasting our breath. See, he said, he took a genuine concern in your welfare. He's doing something about it. It's not like a Facebook interest. It's like, ooh, I like that. Click. Oh, man, I love that. Oh, dislike. I'm going to comment. I'm going to share. I'm going to share and like. I'm going to click amen. They're going to they're, they're gonna have an encounter with God today if I click, share, and put amen. What if you, I don't know, called them? There's a difference between a social media interest and a superficial interest that we can have nowadays and a real genuine concern for people. What if we went beyond the superficial and said, you know what, I'm actually going to put, put some steps to the care that I have for people and I'm going to have a genuine interest to lift up other people in my life. On my worst days when I realize that today is horrible, this is the worst work day ever, I'm going to let it be a, just an alarm clock in my mind to say, it's not because today's horrible, it's just a reminder that I, I, I need to lift other people up more because this is all a reminder of why things aren't going my way, so I'm just going to try a little bit harder to make things go other people's way and there's a joy that comes along with that there's a joy that comes with living beyond just me if I'm always looking at myself I'm telling you I'm disappointed a lot but fulfilled joy within me comes from living beyond me how can I lift other people people up. This is a principle that transcends that transcends race, gender, age, demographic. I don't care who you are. This is the principle that says, hey, if you want to live fulfilled joy in your life, I got to do like Paul is talking about. He, he had every reason to not live out these things, but he looked beyond himself. He said, complete my joy. I'm looking to you, living my life for others. So my, so my, my thought to you is this. Don't let life draw you inward. Because especially when life gets difficult, it's going to say, hold on for dear life. Self-preserve. Get in your turtle shell. Flap your arms and scream. Gripe about everything. See the worst. The water's too deep. The slide was too fast. It's just horrible. It's not going your way. And life's going to tell you to do that because you self-preserve. Do what's best for you. But what I want to say is don't let life draw you inward and make you miss out on the joy that God wants you to live no matter what. And that joy is fulfilled from looking beyond me. Don't kill a moment of joy. Don't, don't kill a lifetime of joy for a moment of happiness. Would you stand up with me? I don't know if this was for anybody else in here today who struggles with seeing the worst in everything, who struggles with only doing things for yourself, and who struggles with saying, hey, look, I'm going to be there for you, but I'm really not. But I struggle with this. And I realize that life's more about, life's more than just a moment of happy. And I really want to pursue joy for my life. I really want to pursue more for my life. So that means I've got to live for more than just my life. How can I live to lift others? Humble myself and lift others. So as you leave, you're going to go back to normal life. We, the church is a bubble. We get to come in, we sing. We see the best of everybody. 
everyone showered, they're pretty, they got their best clothes on. When we leave from here, we leave the bubble. We go back into life, the same job, the same struggles, but we can go back different people. And continually ask yourself, why am I mad right now? Am I living for me? Do nothing out of selfish ambition. In nothing, gripe and complain. God, help me to live that out. Come on, if you'd bow your heads, I want to pray for you. Father, thank you. God, thank you for realizing the things that we struggle with and giving us instruction to live through it. God, thank you. Help us with this because it's default and it's instinct to turn inward in life, to be all about me and and inflated self-ego. Look at me. If it doesn't go my way, I'm griping, complaining. If it doesn't, God, that's not who you've called us to be. We really want to live fulfilled joy. It's living beyond me. Help us to do that. Help us to put it in practice every single day. As your head will continue to be be bowed, I want to ask you this. If you're in this place and you don't know Jesus, I mean, you've never given your life to Christ before. You've never said, Jesus, be the Lord of my life. I, I just want to tell you this, that there is more for you. That Jesus, the Son of God, came out of heaven, saw our brokenness, And he died on a cross, all to pay the penalty for every sin that we've ever done. And because of that, all we have to do is accept his payment, accept the sacrifice Jesus made, and that he makes you a new creation. Everything that you've done is wiped away, and you're you're put in the family of God for now and eternity. And if that's you, and you say, I need to accept Jesus as my Savior today, I want to invite you to do that. If you would, just slip your hand up. I'm the one looking. I want you to just raise your hand, and I want to see who you are. I want to pray for you. I'm not going to do anything weird. I just want to know who I'm praying for. Awesome. Maybe you're in this place today, and you're like, you know what? I struggle with these things that you're talking about today that that Paul talked about, selfishness. And will you just pray for me as as I go back into life to be able to live the fulfilled joy? If you'd slip your hand up. God, you see the hands, you see the hearts. Help us. Help us as we leave to be the people you've called us to be. To do nothing out of selfish ambition. In everything, look for the good. Quit griping and complaining. And how can we actually live out genuine concern and interest in others? God, help us. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us for this week's sermon at City Church. We are passionate about seeing people lead full lives in Christ, and we truly hope that you've been impacted today by God's Word. If there's anything that we can do for you, or you would like to share with us what God has spoken to you today through this message, please email us at info at citychurchlufkin.com. Or for more information about who we are, visit us online at citychurchlufkin.com dot com.